Well, good morning again. I think um, we may have set a record today for the most good morning church uh, that we heard. These young men, every single one, they've just greeted us, and, uh, and that was so, such, a, such a blessing, I, I know, for us to take today and to not only honor the Lord and remember what He's done for us, uh, as we do every Sunday, but to take uh, this morning and also in a few minutes honor our graduates and their families and for these young men to have a chance to, to lead us in this time. And, and Jacob is right, you, you look at that and then put it alongside what happened last week as we were just celebrating with uh, our youngest members and our young families too. Uh, I'm really, really grateful for all that God is doing here in this place. And I hope today is just another reminder for, for all of us to be able to, to praise God for what he's doing. If you have a, a copy of the scriptures with you, let me invite you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll look at that passage of scripture together here in just a moment, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We have been, uh, over the last several weeks, uh, we've been working our way through this series on the spiritual disciplines. And just want to make a few comments here today about that in general, and then we'll spend a little less time than we have been drilling in on, on the specific discipline for today. I know in uh, our classes to follow, you'll have an opportunity to, to hear more from our teachers on that uh, particular topic. But just want to talk about the disciplines in general, because that idea, that, that word discipline can really be a little off-putting for some people. You know, it can sound really rigid, um, it can, can sound sort of demanding or, or, or harsh, um, and maybe even worse than that, talking about spiritual disciplines as we have over the last several weeks, it can really induce a lot of guilt. I don't know if you've experienced that, we certainly won't ask for a you know, show of hands or anything, but I think most Christians, at least the ones I talk to, they, they seem to have this, this pervading sense that, hey, look, I'm, I'm not reading my Bible like I should, you know, and, and I'm, I'm probably not praying as often as I should either. So, so most of us kind of walk around with that sort of sense anyway. And then in a series like this, we, we add on, we do three or four or five, six other spiritual disciplines, you know, and, and I think sometimes if we're not careful, the temptation might be to walk away saying like, well, great, I already knew I wasn't praying enough and reading my Bible enough now. Uh, thanks, Jace. I know I'm not generous enough, <laughs> and I, I know I'm not spending enough time in solitude or, or whatever. And so, um, so sometimes we'll be tempted to think, I, I guess I just need to try harder when it comes to these disciplines. And I want to take a minute just to speak into that up front here this morning, because we, we've danced around that a little bit in this series, but we haven't really kind of gone there specifically. So I just want to take a minute here in this series to, to say this. Um, these spiritual disciplines really aren't about trying harder. I think that's important. Uh, one of the, the quotes that's helped me on this is something that John Ortberg said in a talk on the spiritual disciplines he did not long ago. He said the spiritual disciplines aren't about trying harder. Instead, we need to think of them as God's way of training us. When it comes to the spiritual life, I think, I think many of us are trying as hard as we can anyway. You know, sure, we, we could stand to, to put forth maybe a little bit more effort here or there, but, but the idea of, of, of the spiritual disciplines and us walking away with this sense of, I just need to try harder, you know what the problem with that is? If, if that's all we hear over these seven or eight weeks, then we, we've really failed to communicate what's going on. Because if you walk away from, from a study like this and the only takeaway is, I just need to try harder, the problem with that is that the focus and the emphasis is on me, right? The, the, the focus and the emphasis is on it's on me and it's on what, you know, what I'm supposed to be, be doing. That's what the try harder mentality is, is really all about. And that's the wrong point of emphasis, at least as it pertains to these spiritual disciplines. These spiritual disciplines, as we've said many times, they're practices that God uses to grow us at the soul level. So the, the emphasis here is not so much about, hey, you just need to try harder. Instead, the emphasis here is on the training, the way in which God is training us to be the types of people he wants us to be, the disciplines are his way of training us. And the good thing about that is that puts the emphasis back on God. You see that? 
It's less about what I'm trying to do, and it's more about what God is aiming to do through these practices. So again, this Ortberg quote for me is a great one. Spiritual disciplines are not just about trying, trying harder, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. No, let's think of it as, as training. Shifting into that training mentality is huge. And that leads us to this passage today. I told you we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'd like for us to, to read it together here uh, because this is a passage that really kind of speaks to this, I believe. 1 Corinthians 9, we'll look at verses 24 through 27 today. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize, he says. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Hold, hold this thought on verse 25. We're going to come back to this, okay? Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever, okay? Again, we're going to come back to that idea here in just a minute, all right? Uh, going on, the next verse. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. He says, no. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. <laughs> Paul uses this uh, example of athletes running uh, in, a, in a race. And um, if you want to compete in a race, I know some of you are are runners, you do this kind of regularly. Uh, if you're going to compete in a race, the question would be, okay, do, do you have to try hard? Some of these students here yesterday, they just came from the state track meet yesterday and did fairly well. I know at least a couple of them did, right? Uh, you have to try hard when you run a race. I guess that's sort of a given, okay? But here's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, if you just get up off your couch, like some of the rest of us, right, and you go to the starting line of the Rocket City marathon in a couple of months, and you just say, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to try really hard to run this race. What do you think is going to happen? Nothing good, okay? <laughs> Nothing good, because trying is only going to get you so far. What you need to do instead of just trying hard on that day is you have to put in the work of training, right, in order to compete at that level. I have a friend, a little sidebar, he actually tried that once. Um, seriously, he, he was in his late 20s, early 30s, and uh, he's in, still in pretty good shape, but in his mind, he was still like that 18-year-old athlete, you know? He, he was like off by about 10 years of reality, but in his mind, he was, felt like he was much younger, much more capable. And so his friends were talking about this race they were training for, and uh, he made the comment, he was like, I could go out and run 26 miles right now. That's the distance of a marathon. And they said, you're crazy. You can't do that. And he's like, yeah, I can. Absolutely. Let's go. And so they took him up on that. They, they went out and they said, okay, just go. And so they started like tracking how far he could go just by trying hard. And to his credit, you know, he got up off the couch and he made it about six or seven miles and then he collapsed in a heap. <laughs> and he learned a really important lesson that day. It's a lesson some of us have to learn too. Trying Trying really hard is only going to take you so far. Training will take you further. And when it comes to the spiritual disciplines, that's what Paul is kind of emphasizing here. And that's an important point for us as we think about this series. Paul emphasizes this key idea of training. And I want you to look back again at verse 25. I told you we'd, we'd come back and look at that, okay? So here it is again. He says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And then he says, they do it. And what is it? Well, it's going into strict training, the thing he just said, all right? So they, the runners in this physical race, they go into strict training to get a crown, he says, that will not last, but we as followers of Christ, we do it. And again, what is the it? Well, it's going into strict training, spiritual training for the spiritual race we're in. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. That's the goal of the spiritual race metaphor here that Paul is, is using. 
It is a crown that will last forever. And so just as that physical training is required for that physical race, his point is that this spiritual race that we're on requires spiritual training as well. Athletes will follow the the training regimen set out by their coaches as they prepare for a physical race, as they compare for any sort of uh, as they com- uh, prepare for any sort of competitive uh, experience there. And in this spiritual race, God is using these spiritual practices as part of our training. Puts God in the position of being the one who coaches us. And the spiritual disciplines, that's, that's like the way he runs his practice. Is that, is that helpful? Is that, is that a helpful way to maybe think about what we've been talking about over the last several weeks? These practices are the things that God uses as he tries to train us at the soul level. So when I think about the disciplines just as trying harder, that keeps the focus in the wrong place. It keeps it all about me as if it's all about human effort. Just try harder and you'll grow spiritually. It's not the point. Instead, the better way of thinking about it is to think about these spiritual disciplines as as training, as these practices God uses to grow us at the soul level, okay? And then he kind of just expands on that in the next part of what we read in verses 26 and 27. He says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly, but instead he says, I I, I beat my body so that I can have control over it, so that I can make it my slave. Training for our spiritual race certainly does involve some, some physical elements, from time to time. You know, as, as we think about this, this spiritual race that we're in, the, the spiritual walk that, that we're a part of, you know, Sam was talking about that just a moment ago, there, there are embodied practices that are a part of that. Baptism is an embodied practice. You say, well, it's just spiritual. Yeah, but there's a physical component to that. The Lord's Supper, it is a spiritual practice, but it has this physical component to it, right? Uh, fasting is one of those that is sort of an obvious place to go when you think about the, the physical and the spiritual kind of coming together. And, and, and I know some of you have been, been practicing that regularly and you, and you talk about, man, this is what I'm experiencing spiritually just by denying myself a little bit over here in the physical realm. So we understand that. And Paul is taking this, this point kind of to the extreme when he says he makes his body his slave, that he, he beats, he tries to have mastery over that. He, he's saying that this spiritual race requires a certain amount of bodily discipline. One of the great temptations in life is to allow your body to be your master. You know this to be true. To allow your body and your your bodily appetites, your bodily urges to become like the controlling principle of your life. That's one of the great temptations, one of the great challenges of the Christian faith. Your body will, will call all the shots if you let it. Your bodily, again, appetites, your bodily desires. One of the easiest examples of this is to look at what's happened in our culture in the last 50 or 60 years since the so-called sexual revolution in the 1960s, and you see the, the, the shift that has happened in our culture as people have elevated sexual desire to the highest place in their thought process. For thousands of years, sexual activity was considered just that, activity. It was considered behavior. But now in our day, a person's sexuality has become really tethered to not just behavior, but man, it is your total Identity. That's one of the kind of the, the, the core uh, shifts that has taken place in our culture. And that, that categorical shift away from thinking about sex as behavior to thinking about sex as identity, that is at the root of the LGBTQ movement today. So to speak out against something that the scriptures say is sinful behavior has now, according to the popular thought process here, it has become an attack on a person's identity. You see that shift? And that just illustrates the point of how easy it is for bodily desires to become the master, for the body to be the one calling all the shots, so much so that we've we've shifted our language to now kind of point in this direction of, of, of identity, your behavior becoming your core identity. 
But the Bible's really clear that the body is not intended to be your master. The great spiritual struggle here is to gain mastery over your body and over those desires, to make your body the, your, your slave, as Paul says. And certainly there are a lot of applications beyond sexuality. That's just the easiest place to go. You could look at this in terms of gluttony or drunkenness or any of a number of other uh, forms of addiction. The point is that the body is not meant to be your master. Dallas Willard, you ought to go read Dallas Willard while this stuff is still fresh in your mind. Uh, any of his books will, will do. But he has a really helpful way of kind of uh, categorizing the spiritual disciplines into uh, two groups, disciplines of engagement and then disciplines of abstinence, he says. So disciplines of engagement are things like study, things like prayer, things like service. Disciplines of abstinence are things like fasting and solitude. Basically, it's a way of thinking about the disciplines in terms of what you do and what you deny yourself, what you do and what you don't do, okay? And these disciplines of abstinence in particular are helpful and helping us uh, gain mastery over the body and its appetites. It's one of the ways God runs his practice to try and discipline us in this area. So let's spend just the, the last part of our time together now uh, digging in on this, this particular discipline today. And again, you'll hear more about it in class or in your, your small groups or whatever. But um, I just want to kind of do a hard pivot and think for the next you know, five or ten minutes about this idea of Christian service, okay? That's the spiritual discipline for us today, Christian service. And so I'd like to look at another passage with you. We've been there in 1 Corinthians. If you just go a, a little further into the New Testament, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And I think this is one of the, the greatest passages that gets at the heart of, of the nature of Christian service, okay? This is what it says in Ephesians 2. Uh, verse 10. It says, for we are God's workmanship. So we're jumping in midstream after a big long teaching by Paul, okay, but his takeaway is we are God's workmanship. And then there's this, we are created in Christ Jesus. We become new creations in Jesus. That's the whole gospel move. The old is gone, the new has come, all right? So you've been created, we have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance, it says, for us to do. Again, for my money, this is one of, the, one of the greatest teachings in the scriptures about the nature of Christian service, okay? So this word workmanship, it's a little strange sounding to us. We don't use that word a lot in our just walking around everyday life, but the Greek word beneath that English word, uh, it's, it's this word spelled out, poema, okay? Uh, you can see it's, it's very similar to an English word we use. It's for the same word from which we get our word for poem. It really it means any kind of like a creative composition. Another substitute word here would be masterpiece. Okay? So if you're just kind of looking at what Paul is saying, he's, he's using a word that they would have understood. And he's saying, guys, to the church, you know, look, we are God's masterpiece of creation. How's that for a a New Testament spin on what we saw in the Old Testament. You remember how God created in the Old Testament? He basically says, let there be, and bam, and it happens, and it happens, and it happens, and he creates all these things, and it's good. The creation is good. The way God made it is good. I mean, all of those things, he says, it's good, 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 good. And then he creates humanity. He creates male and female to bear his image. Remember that? And then when he, he does that, he sits back and he says, now that, that's very good. There's something intrinsically dignified and, and special and important about every human life because every human life bears that divine imprint. Every human life was intended to image God, maybe in unique ways. Maybe, maybe you know, these students will image God in, in unique ways that, that differs from the ways that you or I might image God, but, but it doesn't take away the point that there's intrinsic value to every human life because every human life is made in the image and likeness of God. And then Paul comes along in the New Testament and he takes that idea, he takes it a step further and he says, we as the redeemed people of God, not because of anything we have done, but only because we have put our trust in the blood of Jesus Christ 
to cleanse us from our unrighteousness that keeps us from God, because we've been recreated by that blood, because we've been recreated by going through the water just like Israel did, we have gone from slavery to freedom. We've now become a new creation, he says. And as that new creation, we now move forward to participate in the same creative work of God, that he calls us to do good works which he prepared in advance for us. What happens after you're saved? What happens after you come to know Jesus? What happens after, you know, you give your life to the Lord in baptism, you confess his lordship, and they take you down, they say the words, and they bring you back up, and then what? Well, I just kind of wait around until I die, then I can go to heaven. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. That is, that is not what the scriptures say. After we have come to know Jesus as Lord, the beautiful part is that God then enlists us in the same kingdom work that he is a part of. If we get to this whole idea of the, the, the creative masterpiece, the composition, once we're saved, God comes along and puts a paintbrush in your hand, you know, and he says, hey, will you go take care of that corner over there? Because I'm still trying to kind of color in this beautiful painting. I still have a little bit of work to do here, and I could use your help. That's what happens after you come to know the Lord. You're enlisted in the same kingdom work. And, it, and so he describes those works as, as good works. And then this part, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. I told you, this is, I think, the most powerful teaching in the New Testament about the nature of Christian service. He has prepared these good works in advance for us from the beginning, from the very beginning, before you were even created, this teaching says. God has set the table for some good works that he intends for the redeemed version of you, the kingdom version of you, to participate in. And the, the, one of the beauties of coming to know Jesus is discovering what that good work might be. What do you think those good works are that he prepared in advance for you? I don't know what it would be for you. You listen to the Lord enough, and you listen to, to, the, to the leading of his spirit enough, he'll reveal that. Because he doesn't want that to be a mystery. He's not playing hide and seek on that. He wants you to discover the good works that he prepared in advance for you. All I know is what it is for me. Part, part of what it is for me is this, you know, to, to stand here week after week and to share this, this good news with you, you know. That's just, that's just what it is for me. I feel like, in light of this teaching, that part of the good works God prepared in advance for me before I was ever even born, before my parents were born, before the world existed, I think God intended for me to stand here on this day and preach this word to you. That's what I believe. Because that's part of the good works he's prepared in advance for me. I hope that doesn't come off the wrong way. I'm, I'm just trying to say, like, that's what it is for me, right? So what is it for you? What is that good work that he's called you to? I thought maybe another way to put it is, is this. There is a ministry to which God is calling you. When people ask me what I do for a living. I usually just tell them, you know, I'm a, I'm a minister. And I love what I get to do. I'm so grateful I get to serve this church in that way. But it is a bit unfortunate that we've used that term so narrowly to describe someone who works at the church. When the, the teaching of the New Testament is that ministry is something we all participate in as we come to know the Lord. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, Simon Peter says that all believers have become part of God's royal priesthood. Those Old Testament priests, they were ministers. They served God and they served others. And Simon Peter makes this connection between that Old Testament role and us. That's our identity. He says we are a royal priesthood, we serve the king, and we serve the world. And we have now been enlisted in the ministry of the Lord. So my question for you today that I want you to kind of ponder here as we, as we wind down. The question for you to think about, what is your ministry? If we all are called into that service of ministry, what, what is it for you? What ministry has God prepared in advance for you? 
And I'll just tell you, my dream for this church, my dream for Mayfair is that one day we would be able to answer that question at, at the level of every, every person, every man, every woman, every child would be able to say with confidence, this is my ministry. This is what, what I do as part of you know, my service to the kingdom. And that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be bashful about that. We wouldn't like shy away because well, I don't want to be boastful or whatever. No, like it, let's own the fact that God has created these good works in advance for us. And, and let's just be able to answer that. This is how I'm serving. How about you? And we could mutually encourage one another along those lines. We had a, f- a funeral service here yesterday. Uh, Ms. Sue Lee passed away and we had, we had her service here yesterday. And there were people who were here, and, 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 you know, in light of where we were going to go today, I was thinking, okay, her ministry is encouraging. Her ministry is, is wrapping her arms around loved ones and being there and being present when someone's hurting. We had another group of people in the back here who were preparing a meal for, for the family after the service. Their ministry, at least on that day, at least in that moment, was using their hands to prepare that meal to serve someone in a moment of pain. Sam talked about being at 2820. Maybe you say, like, okay, my ministry is to the men and the women and the children who are, who are experiencing homelessness in this community. Maybe you say, you know, my ministry is teaching uh, the, the four-year-olds. Maybe my ministry is praying for people who don't yet know Jesus. Or, or my ministry is trying to encourage our deacons you know, who, who, who serve kind of behind the scenes oftentimes. Uh, my ministry is to be a 10th grade huddle leader, or, or my ministry right now is staying home and raising my babies, you know? That's ministry. What a worthwhile calling, you know? Um, I don't know what it would be. Maybe it's say, like, right now, my ministry is just being a Christ-like presence in the marketplace. Goodness knows we need that. I don't know what it would be for you, but I just pray today you would take some time to think about that and and ponder that. What is your ministry? If you know your ministry, then then praise God. Uh, My prayer is that you would continue to pursue that. But if not, I just go go before the Lord with an open heart and ask him to reveal that. Last thing I want to share with you quickly, and then we've got some, some special people to honor here. I just want to encourage you to ask this question because this is the servant's question. What can I do for you today? When you ask that question in faith, I believe God will reveal an answer to you. Uh, Just see what he does with that. See how he reveals good works that were prepared in advance for us. You ask your spouse that question, you ask your coworkers that question, you ask your parents, ask your children. Most importantly, you ask God that question good things will happen. You think Jesus asked that question? What can I do for you today? I think you see examples of that in the scriptures. He absolutely asked that question. That's why he's the greatest servant the world has ever seen. And Jesus stands ready to serve our greatest need, and that is to provide freedom from sin and guilt and death. So as we close this time of reflection, let me just ask, would you turn to him to receive salvation today? Would you turn to him and allow him to serve you by bringing that gift into your life? He says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but rather to pour himself out as a servant, to give himself up as a ransom for many. And if you'd like to respond to that incredible gift, I hope you'll do so today as we sing this next song in just a moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord who makes all things new, he who has ears, let him hear. Let's stand now and let's sing.